Okay, hi everyone. We're gonna do um, the recording for the dental implants and peri-implant care. That's chapter 31 in Darby and Walsh. These are the objectives for this uh, lesson. So we'll talk a little bit about um, what an implant is. And I know this is review. So an implant is typically a three piece um, unit, which comes with the actual implant itself, uh, which is um, made out of titanium and it's like a screw and all these threads, um, the titanium and the bone um, fuse in osteo um, integration. And then generally what they do is they'll put on an abutment and there's usually a healing abutment. And then there is the abutment that has this prep shape part that the eventual crown will go onto. And so these are the pieces of an implant. Um, why would someone choose implant therapy? Well, typically it's obviously tooth loss to replace a natural tooth. And that could be because of periodontal disease, caries, trauma, congenitally missing teeth, or to support a removing prosthesis from maybe one of the previous, any of one of the previous reasons. Indications and contraindications and client selection. So there's no specific absolute cons, um, contraindications for the use of dental implants, um, but there are cautions. So somebody is uh, not necessarily like there isn't necessarily one person that you would never ever put an implant in. Theoretically, you could put an implant into anybody. However, there are perimeters that would make it either successful or not successful. And the surgeons are aware of these. So if they've had a history of head and neck radiation, if they've used bisphosphonates, especially IV bisphosphonates, um, or if they're poorly controlled systemic, um, disease, especially diabetes, and then even smoking. So all of those are like um, very caution cautionary. There's other things too that would impact it, like say the amount of bone that's just present. I mean that, it, you know, if, if they're trying to put an implant into a very um, thin mandible that there's been a lot of bone, um, bone loss just in general, like it's resorbed say from, um, just not having teeth in their jaw, um, then that also would play a big role. So they also wanna consider things such as client's expectations, um, his or her willingness to participate in the treatment plan because it's expensive and it, and it takes a while to get it done. Um, how good do they do currently with their oral hygiene? Are they a smoker? And the history of periodontal disease, if they have it, have they been stable for a while or are they not stable? Because then they wouldn't make a good candidate. So these things are all very cautionary for a surgeon. So osteo um, osteo integration is um, functionally stable interface between the bone and an implant device without the presence of any connective tissue. So it's bone to implant. There's no uh, ligaments that sort of push in in between or connective tissue, it's just bone to titanium. And so that's what it's showing um, by the side-by-side -side comparison. So there's different types of implants. You can do a single tooth implant. Uh, you could do a bridge or, you know, like a multiple units, either fused or not fused. Um, and then you could put in several implants to support a denture. And this is just further showing different ways. There's bars, um, there's single implants with these little ball attachments. And then there's usually like this little O-ring on the denture side and it, it's just made of rubber. And those usually wear out, they have to be replaced, um, but those help with retention as well. And the denture pops on and off. So you can clean underneath the denture, clean the denture, clean the implants um, for, the, for the patient to keep it all cleanly. So stages of treatment, the extraction of the tooth, and a healing period of about three to six months. Generally, the healing is faster on the maxilla than the mandible. The surgical placement of the implant and a healing uh, period, um, of, again, of three to six months. Um, so first, they're going, if they extract the tooth and do a bone graft, 
they want that bone to solidify before they go in with the implant. So that's, so there's usually like two, the two separate surgical. Now, sometimes they will go in immediately with an implant after an extraction. So these are all decisions based on the surgeon, their expertise, their, the way they like to do things, what they think they could actually do and not do because of their experience and whatnot. So there are various situations, but in general, there will be an extraction with or without bone grafting and then the surgical placement of the implant. And both of those need separate healing times. Then they uncover, and then again, they can either leave the implant with a healing abutment. And so it's it's basically exposed to the outside world. Um, the top of it is with this, this little flat healing abutment, or they cover the implant completely and then they stamp through the tissue when they're ready to put uh, an abutment and a crown on it. There may be significant variations in this generalized summary, individual specific conditions, implant location, bone quality, and practitioner's expertise, like I said. Um, they do a workup and it's basically, uh, they sometimes create things um, like a surgical guide, which will actually let them know exactly where they want to make the hole to put the implant in. Um, they take lots of different types of imaging from the CBCT scan to see where nerves are, the thickness of bone, um, all these different elements. They map it out and get really specific. So, and this this is what they do if they're a good quality surgeon. Uh, you know, if, if they're just, oh yeah, I can do an implant and they just stick it in there somewhere, then they're far likely more likely to have a failure. But if they're a good surgeon and they take all this into account, then they'll have a higher success rate. So the, um, this is just going through the stages of surgery. Um, and it basically says what I talked about and kind of did an overview. So you can read through this. This is just demonstrating the stages of surgery. Um, this is making the initial um, surgical incision into the bone, prepping it, um, and then, putting in the implant. Um, the second stage, is, you know, this is where they punched a hole through the tissue. Um, and you can now see that there's a, an implant there. Um, here they have different kinds of abutments. They have surgical abutments here, um, or healing abutments, should I say, that these aren't final abutments, they're healing abutments. Um, and then restoration and prosthesis, fabrication of a prosthesis is often falsely considered the final step in an implant therapy when maintenance is a key and ongoing factor for implant success and survival. So many people will be like, oh, yay, an implant. I never have to, you know, floss that tooth again, which is very, very false because they want to be actually extra careful and keep that extra clean because it was such a lengthy, lengthy procedure and it costs so much money. Um, considerations to for prosthesis would be the shade and the contour of the actual prosthesis, the cleansability, you know, the contour affects the cleansability, the texture, the material, um, the emergence profile, which again sort of has to do with contour and just, you know, how it's um, shaped in the mouth um, and for cleansability and for aesthetics, um, interproximal space, and then the tissue contact. Material and design, um, it's, you know, they're always making changes and improvements. Typically, it's pure titanium or a titanium alloy. There are some ceramic, carbon, or other alloys av available, but they're not used nearly as often as in just titanium. Um, these are different levels um, or different kind of designs of an implant. There's bone level internal hex connection. You can see there's like a, like a little hexagon shape on the inside here, there's internal hex connection. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that said external because it's sticking up. And then the internal, you can't see it. And then there's a tissue level implant. Um, so there's uh, different designs and different doctors or surgeons will prefer different designs. There's something called platform switching and you'll see this on the radiograph. It used to be that this was a very smooth um, transition between the um, abutment or the prosthesis and the implant. I think the abutment and the implant. Um, 
but there there's a micro gap here. So it's impossible to eliminate this micro gap. You can't see the micro gap, um, but it's impossible to eliminate it. So then there was bacteria right there at the, the right by the bone. So almost always, 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 you would eventually see bone loss down to the first couple threads um, on these old style implants until they started to do something called platform switching, which instead of making the platform the whole base of the implant, they made it come in. See how there's this little ledge and it comes in over here. And so now the, the, the micro gap is now away from the bone. See the bones over here and the micro gaps over here. So it actually makes the bone far happier. Um, so there's less bone loss around the implant. And, um, and then if this is important aspect of peri-implantitis or inflammation around the, around the implant. So that's kind of an interesting um, thing to note. You can see the difference between older and newer implants. So screw retained versus cement retained. Um, cement retained are oftentimes used in anterior teeth, but there is a risk of leaving cement to, and it would stick out kind of like a piece of calculus. And so then you can have um, bacterial growth and, and problems with the tissue inflammation and bone loss, what have you, due to the cement. There's been many cases where there's been a huge chunk of cement left and it caused a lot of um, bone loss and inflammation. Screw retained is oftentimes better because then they can just go, they do a little composite um, filling. To, it's an access hole, but then they can just unscrew it and put in a new um, crown or fix something if they need to access the implant, where cement retained is much more difficult to do that. Um, it's interesting to note the biology difference between the teeth and the implant. We know about all of our fiber groups that are in between the bone and the tooth um, embedded into the cementum, um, circ going around the neck of um, the gingiva around the tooth, going from the gingiva into the bone um, and what have you. So all of these different fiber groups. But if you notice on an implant, the only fiber groups you have are going from the gingiva to the bone and then encircling the implant. So that's what these dots here are. They're circumference, they're um, fibers um, going in a circle, the circumference of the implant around it, but not actually going into the implant or next to the implant, just around the implant. Uh, keratinized versus non-keratinized mucosa. Um, it's really, really important actually for an uh, individual to have keratinized mucosa around an implant because that gives them a much um, sturdier tissue, a much tighter sort of ring of gingiva around the implant. It protects more. Um, the non-keratinized is going to be your loose kind of um, more red from the um, vascular supply, um, not adhered, softer, more delicate tissue. And so oftentimes you can see issues arise more often around non-keratinized mucosa and dental implants. That's not to say someone can't keep it clean and it can't be successful, but it's, it's a higher risk and um, it's just not as ideal. Maintenance and the role of the dental hygienist. So you want to identify, evaluate, and document the following signs and symptoms of oral problems, risk factors, and issues associated with the dental implant. So you want to um, write down any changes in their health history like you would typically would, location of the implant, and confirm when it was put in and document it. Um, every time you look at them and evaluate, document how the oral the mucosa looks around the implant. Find out if there's discomfort, if there's pain, if there's any infection at all around the implant. Document all of that, bleeding upon probing, um, all of this, these things. Uh, maintenance and the role of the dental hygienist. Um, changes in the health history. Again, you want to document, the, again, the oral mucosa condition. This is from the last slide. We said this already. Color, texture, and overall condition of the mucosal peri-implant tissues as measured by the following. You want to measure attached peri-implant tissue, so that keratinized, uh, keratinized tissue. You want to measure periodontal probing depths. Is there bleeding or not, or no bleeding? 
presence of exudate in, sul in the sulcus around the abutment. So exudate being um, like infectious fluid um, or pus. Amount of oral biofilm and calculus formation, oral hygiene knowledge and behaviors, how well is the patient caring for it? Is there any mobility or any occlusal interference? And then of course, every year you take an extra PA of it and you wanna try and take it in the same vertical and horizontal angulation so that you can mimic that same look. Because remember from radiology, if you change your vertical angulation, you can change the way the bone looks. So try to get the shot in the same plane so that you can see a true change in bone height. Um, and then presence of mechanical problems with the prosthetic component. Um, signs of disease, progressive increase in probing depth, suppuration and exudate or pus around the, um, the from the peri-implant space, bleeding, clinical uh, appearance of inflamed tissue, bleeding, swelling, color change, suppuration, flat calculus, progressive loss of supporting bone on follow-up radiographs, loss of supporting bone beyond 0.2 millimeters annually after the expected physiological remodeling. So this is saying that there is a very, very, so within your first year, you would not be surprised to see a slight loss of bone, bone loss, um, which is basically called physiologic remodeling. That's what they're referring to. So it's not necessarily like, oh no, you're losing bone. This There's a remodeling that the bone goes through very slight and that would be expected, but it would stop after the first year. And then you wouldn't see it every year. It would go, it shouldn't go down, down, down. Um, it should stop after the first year. Probing, you can uh, use a traditional probe. You're going to hear, uh, this is controversial, and you'll hear some doctors say no. In our clinic, we don't do it, but many surgeons will say it's fine to use a metal probe as long as you're very, very light and you probe well. So, you know, that's why we don't use them in our clinic is for one, we want to just err on the side of caution. But really one thing you'll know about those plastic probes is that, and implants is that sometimes the implant can be very bulbous and the plastic probe can be harder sort of to get down in between there. Um, but also some people actually like the flexibility of a plastic probe as opposed to the rigidity of the metal probe. So it's sort of um, a preference, but we do recommend as far as I know, unless they've changed protocol, um, they have, they were only having you use uh, plastic probes in clinic. Um, you can always obviously check with Holly or Gail on that. Um, and then, um, so yes, light force, light pressure, and then you want to get your baseline and it may be deeper than three millimeters. So it's not unusual to have probe an implant and have it be four, but if there's no inflammation and no bleeding, then you just record that and, you know, put everything down and then you just, and you know, you move on. It's okay. Radiographs, um, this is a radiograph of implant. Um, uh, the, well, the tooth number 36 is replaced, so they're using a different numbering um, scale. And then the radiograph showing bone loss of the implant to your follow-up. So this is quite um, dramatic bone loss around it. So this would catch your attention. Um, and this may have something to do. You can see the threads are all the way down here. So they've lost bone all the way down to the threads. So something is affecting that. Um, peri and so maintenance for peri implantitis. Peri implantitis is the loss of crestal peri implant bone in conjunction with bleeding on probing. If there's mobility of the implant structure, it indicates a complete loss of osteo integration and total implant failure. If you even get a little mobility around an implant, that is no good. There's, there's no like classification where a little mobility is okay. If there's mobility, that's pretty much failure of the implant. The first step in management of periimplantitis is to identify and remedy the local factor and the etiology, such as retained dental cement, poor contours of the prosthesis, and poor personal hygiene. Non-surgical um, debridement is conju in conjunction with medical management of inflammation. Surgical therapy, therapy includes granulation tissue removal, thorough cleaning, um, of the contaminated surface. And a lot of times a surgeon will do this at this point, they'll flap it back 
um, very oftentimes, you know, they may let a hygienist give it a, an attempt the first time, depending on where you work, who you work for, um, to try and get that inflammation under control. But if they really feel like things are going south fast, then the doctor oftentimes chooses to flap it back and decontaminate and clean it up in more of a minor surgical procedure. Oh, my daughter just knocked on my office door. So hold on just a second. Let me pause this. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so implant disease. So there's two different things. You can relate these to gingivitis and periodontitis. Peri-implant mucositis is kind of like gingivitis, has been defined as a reversible inflammatory reaction that resides in the mucosa and does not include loss of supporting bone. In peri-implant mucositis, bleeding on probing um, must be present. So it's sort of like a gingivitis situation. Um, peri-implantitis defined as inflammatory reaction that's associated with the loss of bone around an implant that's in, is in function is thought to be more difficult to reverse, much like periodontal disease can be um, difficult. So risk factors for peri-implant disease, previous periodontal disease um, certainly puts them at risk for if they have an implant and, and they've you know, um, wrestled with perio for years, if they smoke, um, poor plaque control, poor prosthetic design, and uncontrolled diabetes. So the Armin armamentarium is the antimicrobial agent, um, such as like an arrestin or a perio chip or something, plastic disposable syringe or gingival irrigation. We can teach our patients to irrigate around the implants. That's very beneficial. Um, probing to um, for our assessments, uh, scalers, plastic or titanium, um, thick implant floss, keeping it very clean with floss, usually not a lot of calculus forms around an implant. Um, glycine air polishers are very popular, gel dentifrice, um, tin oxide or non-abrasive prophylactic paste, um, the rubber cup and the pointed polisher. Um, there's a um, we always we're very familiar with our rubber cup for our polisher, but there's also one that's rubber and shaped like a cone. And those are very nice for you can kind of get the tip down below the gingiva. Soft, multi-tufted toothbrush with a compact head design and other appropriate aids for self-care instruction. Um, different kinds of scalers that are available. They have Teflon coated scalers gold tip Gracie scalers, gold tip titanium covered scalers, graphite reinforced nylon scalers. Some of these are just too big, frankly. Um, the ones that are actually made of a metal that is compatible is actually, have, was always my preference. The, the nylon or the plastic, their tips were just huge and you just couldn't barely get it below the gum line unless it was really inflamed. Um, ultrasonic scaler with a disposable poly cell phone um, plastic, I think that's a plastic tip, sorry, that's cutting it off. Um, those are kind of controversial actually, because they have been shown to leave um, debris behind from the plastic. And so I don't know if I, um, that I should probably update that because last I read, those were a little bit controversial, the little protective tips that you put over your ultrasonic scaler. Um, and then if they make an implant, ultrasonic scalers specifically, then of course that would be um, safe as well. Um, titanium implant scalers are recommended on implants coated with um, hydroxyapatite or titanium plasma spray. Plastic curettes can leave deposits on the titanium implant surface, especially those with surface coating, and this has been confirmed on multiple studies. So the the problem is, is there's the concern of leaving something behind or scratching the implant. And so that's where the caution for all these different um, instruments or specialty instruments come from. So when you're in your office um, and you will likely have many patients with implants, do your research and talk with the dental rep and find out what your office and what you feel is, you know, what you like to use and what you feel is best. So there is information out there and people always have their preferences, but to use caution with things that obviously could make the situation or cause damage or make the situation worse. 
Um, so our oral hygiene instruction is not very different. We want to brush at a 45 degree angle with a soft toothbrush. The power toothbrush is wonderful. To um, use a special toothbrush with the two rows of bristles or a uni tuft inner um, space brush or a tapered or flat in proximal brushes. Um, would want to make sure that the if it's an inner proximal brush on a wire that it's nylon coated. Um, oops, sorry. Um, and if or if it's or if just have them not push if it's metal and kind of rub the metal against the, the implant and um, to discard it once it's worn. Um, the rubber tip stimulator can be used very gently just to, or to stimulate the gum tissue and just gently go around the sulcus. Low abrasive toothpaste, dental floss, oral irrigation um, are all wonderful options as well. Low force with the water, um, not to push anything um, down into a sulcus. Um, so you want to use a lower um, water flow. Home care, floss once a day, remove the plaque. This is all pretty standard. This crisscross um, shoe shine method for flossing an implant is wonderful. Um, you loop it like a C and then cross your floss and then pull the sides of your floss and it encompasses the entire neck of the implant and does a wonderful job. And then you can see there's these nice thick ropey um, floss that you can use under um, fixed prosthesis as well. Um, implant failure is Implants ultimately fail due to loss of integration, um, the osseous integration. Removal of implant is the only option and to usually, you know, do a bone graft and then do the whole process, waiting the months and everything all over again. Possible to have an implant replaced, but augmentation or mo more bone grafting may be necessary. Important to understand why the implant failed in the first place, hopefully not to repeat that. Surgical therapy is superior to non-surgical therapy in resolving peri-implantitis and therefore may ultimately be required. And I kind of said that earlier when the hygienist may attempt to calm things down, but if things are really going bad, they really need to go back to the surgeon. So that is the implant um, lecture. And um, that is, uh, oh, 42 minutes. Boy, that was longer than I thought it was going to be. These things always take longer than you think. Have a good evening, you guys, and I will see you in class.